greet our friends everywhere with Chapter 43 of Nine Pence in Her Pocket, the story of Gladys Aylward. This is another in the series, Stories of Great Christians, and comes to you from the Moody Bible Institute in Chicago. As her work with the Chinese seamen in Liverpool grew and prospered, Gladys began to be invited to speak in various cities of Britain. And wherever she went, huge crowds gathered to hear her. No one was more surprised than Gladys at this new speaking ministry that had opened to her, or the fame that was suddenly surrounding her. Always her heart was turned to now communist China, and she yearned over her converts and children who were there. She prayed and dreamed of her return to that land, but post-war England, disillusioned and cynical, the churches deserted, seemed fascinated with this small woman who had dared and believed so much. Stephen, are you there? Can you answer the door? Yes, I will get it. Oh, these letters. I'll never be able to answer them, Lord. There's no end to them. Oh, I hope it's not the post. Come right in, Stephen. I'm observing my mail. Uh, Gladys, there is a gentleman from the BBC to see you. The BBC? What on earth does he want with me? He, uh... He would like to talk to you. Oh, come on now, Stephen. Get it out. What's he want? It, uh, it seems the BBC wants to do a radio program about you. Nonsense. Gladys, uh, he is in the parlor. Uh, you had best uh, talk to him. Stephen, I've got so much mail to answer. Uh, couldn't you just tell him... I that... will help with the mail. Uh, Gladys. <sighs> now, what am I going to say to a man from the BBC? <laughs> You will do fine. Come on. How do you do, Miss Aylward? Uh, it's a pleasure indeed to meet you. How do you do? Uh, yes, uh, this is Mr. Latham, Gladys. Please sit down. Uh, both of you. I assume you've met my fellow worker, Stephen Wong. Yes, yes, indeed. Now, uh, Miss Aylward... Uh, I wonder if you've had the opportunity to hear any of the home hour programs on the Undefeated series. I'm afraid not. Uh, no, well, uh, the BBC is doing a series of radio dramas on great stories of adventure and courage involving well-known and some not-so-well-known people. Uh, some of the stories, like yours, came out of the war. We'd very much like to do your life. Well, well... I'm honored, of course, but, well, I'm a missionary. There were many missionaries in China when the war started. Many others have had tremendous experiences. We've all witnessed the same God working. Uh, yes, and uh, some other stories, of course, uh, we're going to do. But, uh, well, Miss Aylward, uh, there's so much about your life we feel our listeners would benefit from. That march you made through the mountains with all those orphaned children, the fact that you went out to China all alone and stayed all those years, and, uh, the program would certainly focus attention on China and the needs of the people there. I think people should know what God has been doing in China, Gladys, what he's doing right now in spite of the commies. Exactly. When I walked into this room, I had no intention of letting the BBC or anybody else make a radio program about Gladys Aylward. But I'll have to pray about it. I do what God wants me to do. I suppose you know that. Uh, I know that, yes. Would you like a cup of tea? Uh, no, thank you. I, I must be getting back. Uh, uh, will you be getting in touch with me? Oh, yes. Uh, when? I don't know. Would you have any idea? No, I'll let you know as soon as God lets me know. 
Uh, yes, I see. Uh, well, it was very good to talk with you, Miss Aylward, and uh, you, Mr. Wong. Yes, yes, and thank you for coming. Uh, not at all. Uh, goodbye. After long prayer, Gladys allowed the BBC to do the story of her life, which was titled Gladys Aylward, One of the Undefeated. It proved to be one of the most popular programs of the series and was rebroadcast throughout England several times. With the publicity, Gladys became even more in demand as a church speaker, and the news media made her name known throughout the British Isles. But in a strange way, the publicity didn't seem to touch Gladys at all. She remained quite alone, with no manager, no staff, and those who helped her with the floods of mail and her travel arrangements were simply the Christians she found in the cities and churches she visited. Again and again, she spoke to Stephen about her longing to leave England and return to China, but the communists granted no visas to missionaries. Finally, in 1955, she determined to return to the East some way. But, Gladys, you cannot just go, not knowing where you are going. This is 1955. What difference does that make? You're going to just get on a boat, sail around the Cape of South Africa, and get off somewhere in the East and start working. What's wrong with that? I, I didn't know where I was going the first time I went to China. Gladys, be sensible. I never thought I'd hear you say that to me, Stephen. Anybody else, but not you. You cannot get into China, you know. I know. But there are Chinese in every port in the East now. Thousands upon thousands of refugees. Stephen, they're all Chinese, all lost, away from home. Most without hope. Some of them are, are my own children. Oh, I can't stand staying here in England anymore. Is God telling you to do this? Yes. And how will you find all of your children? They will have grown up now, left the orphanages. They could be anywhere. How are you ever going to find even one? I'll get off the boat in every port and just look. Gladys. All right. I will get you a sailing date. Thank you, Stephen. And I'll start getting my affairs in order and writing some letters ahead to say I'm coming. In 1955, Gladys began a long journey by boat back to the east she loved. But it was a sad and discouraging voyage for her. In every port she left ship, preached, and walked the streets asking Chinese refugees about her children. Had anyone seen a Christian woman from Xi'an or Yangcheng called Suilan? A young man called Les, who was a university student. A young woman called... Nine pence? It was an unusual name. Perhaps they'd heard it. Or Pauline, or Miang. But the East seemed to have swallowed up her past in China and every remnant of it. Finally, Gladys found herself once again endlessly walking the teeming streets, this time in Hong Kong, searching the masses of faces for one of her children. Stephen Wong was right, Lord. I've been months and not one child have I found. And no work has opened up to me. Nothing but endless looking and walking. And for nothing. I don't know, Lord. I'm a foolish woman. I can hardly ask you again to help me find one of my children. Oh, 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 I'm sorry. Mother! Michael! Michael! I can't believe it. Mother! No, Michael! Oh, Michael, you're alive. I never thought I would see you again. Mother! I've been looking everywhere. Oh, God. Oh, Michael, look at us. We're blocking the street. Come on. I am taking you home.
With her son, Michael, who was a Bible school student, Gladys founded the Hope Mission in Hong Kong, where refugees and orphans were cared for and evangelized. The work in Hong Kong grew rapidly, until today, Michael and his Christian wife, along with a staff of workers, have six schools for the Chinese orphans in the city, along with the Hope Mission itself. But in 1957, with the work going well, Gladys again became restless, sensing God had something else for her to do. But, Mother, the work is growing here in Hong Kong. You are so needed here. Why would you want to leave? I don't know, Michael. I can't explain it. But God wants me to go on to Formosa, I think. You are wanting to find some of the other children. Well, I haven't been to Formosa. I wonder it is so close to the mainland and the first place most refugees go. Perhaps some of the children have stayed there, hoping to return to China. Which will not happen. But Madame Chiang Kai-shek moved all her orphanages to Formosa. Oh, I don't know why I didn't think of it before. Oh, of course, some of the children must be in Formosa. Let me write some letters for you. Yes, and I'll start finding out about getting there. Mother! Mother! What is it? We've, we've heard from Francis and Jarvis. No! Yes. They, they sent their letters in the same envelope. Oh, let me see. They're in Taiwan, and they want you to come to Formosa. Jarvis is a pilot in the Air Force. Mother, an officer in the Free China Air Force. Oh, oh goodness. I, I can't read this blessed letter. Jarvis. And he was so afraid of play. And Francis is a doctor, Mother. <laughs> oh, no. You must have it the other way around. Uh, Francis was a perfect sissy about blood. Don't you remember that? <laughs> no, it's right, Mother. We're to write them when you're coming, and they'll meet the Go. plane. Francis and Jarvis and you, Michael. Oh, how good God has been to me to give me back three of my children. Oh, let me see the letter again. You read it. I'll call the airport. Passengers um, disembarking at Taiwan from Hong Kong are uh, requested to proceed to gate four. A gate four for passengers from Hong Kong. Oh, Lord, everything is happening so fast. Please let Jarvis and Francis be here. I wait up. Oh, where is he? Mother, mother, over here. Jarvis! <laughs> mother, little mother. Oh, Francis. <laughs> Hello, mother. Oh, boys, you look so fine. We brought some flowers and someone else. Oh, Polly, Polly! My mother. Oh, my, my children. Mother. I've got to sit down. Here, here, mother. Here, here's a bench. Oh, yeah, you all look so fine. So fine. And I'm so happy to see you all. So happy. <laughs> And so we conclude Chapter 43 of Ninepence in Her Pocket, the story of Gladys Aylward. This is another in the series, Stories of Great Christians, and comes to you from the Moody Bible Institute of Chicago. Chicago.